Hello, everybody, and welcome back for week one of the NFL preseason. I'm going to be your host today, Sean, PSU fans to Newsham. We're going to be able to go through uh, the team's playing tonight and go over some brief preseason strategies in regards to full slates where there's not a showdown, where you unfortunately don't get to play as many defenses as you can in showdowns. So with a quick start here, we're going to go into today's slate, and I'll give you a quick overview on some thoughts and sort of how to approach the slate. Obviously, today's slate is only two games, so you're limited in terms of your pool. Generally, when you're limited in terms of your pool, you might have to go a little bit wider in terms of picking people out due to potential and due to um, opportunities because there's not going to be as many thin groups out there as there will be on a full slate. Something that you need to look at in terms of preseason is we'll start with the quarterbacks. One of the main things you want to look for with quarterbacks. Ideally, you want to have a quarterback that has mobility. A mobile quarterback that can go out there and run 30 to 40 yards and possibly have a rushing touchdown is a tremendous asset in the preseason, especially if someone is going to be able to go out there and play two and a half, three quarters and has the rushing ability to go out there and put up some yardage on the ground. Uh, the reason is, is because it's very difficult for a quarterback to hit the bonus in the preseason, especially if they are rotating time with someone else. No one really will hit the bonus if they're only getting uh, one and a half, two quarters of play passing. So that takes away some of your upside uh, in terms of the passing game. So you're looking for guys that can go out there, run a bit, pass a bit. Obviously, you're looking for an opportunity where someone will also play. However, the rushing mobility does add a benefit over guys that are not mobile to where you can sort of play them even if they maybe don't have as significant of a playing time situation as someone else. Uh, looking at running backs and receivers, the most important thing with running backs and receivers is going to be to find groups that are thin. Uh, a slate like today where there is two games, it might be a little bit more tricky. However, we do have some on the slate, which we will get to in a little bit here. But you're looking for running back situations where there's maybe only two or three running backs. Now, that could mean after the starters. Uh, that could mean that you expect the starters to play maybe a series. And then after that, there's very thin opportunities. Um, or it could just be a situation where there's a lot of injuries and you end up having only two running backs, which I think we will see on Friday's slate, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So that's what you're looking for at running back and receiver. If you look at running backs and you see four or five running backs, which we'll see quite a bit today, the situation is, in reality, those guys are only going to get a couple series each. Obviously, someone within that group will end up most likely having the bulk of the carries and will likely outperform the other ones by a bit. But that's going to be very high in variance, and it's a situation where you really can't control. So the idea is for you to try to control the situation as much as possible and get as much playing time and as many touches as you can get. Like last week, we did not expect Samir White to have the volume he had, but... When you look deep down in the situation, all the running backs played a similar-ish amount. Uh, he obviously did play more snaps than everyone else. But when he was on the field, he also got used more than some of the other running backs. So uh, the key is, is if there's only one or two running backs and they have to play effectively the whole game, they're more likely to produce than someone who maybe will play 20, 25% of the snaps. Um, tight ends are exactly the same. You are looking for a situation where you maybe have a bit of extra playing time for someone. However, the difference between tight end and the other positions is some tight ends are not receiving threats at all. So you're realistically looking for a receiving option at tight end. That's going to play quite a bit. If you have a guy that maybe isn't much of a receiving option, but he's going to play a significant amount, he still may not produce because they're just not going to utilize him in the passing game. He'll be more used for blocking purposes. What you find in the preseason is typically – people will go more towards starters who maybe will only play a quarter. So for example, if you have Travis Kelsey and you expect him to play one to one and a half quarters, that might be better than a back end guy that's going to play three, three and a half quarters. Where at running back, it almost certainly will always be the guy that's going to get three, three and a half quarters over a guy that's going to play one to one and a half quarters. Um, so that's something to look at. Defense. So here's something to note with defenses in the preseason you are not wanting to restrict your defenses from playing against the quarterback. Part of the idea with mobile quarterbacks is that they can get out and run and pick up some yards on the ground. However, mobile quarterbacks are typically more prone to run into sacks while they're trying to scramble. 
So if a quarterback goes for a run and gets tripped up and loses one yard of the play, you'll get credit for a sack. So those guys can get you more points for that reason. So you don't want to really exclude defenses against your quarterbacks or your players in general. Also, in regards to the quarterback situation, a lot of the time in the preseason, the reason you are taking a quarterback is because he's going to play the whole game or a significant amount of the game. Well, if this is a guy that is lower down the depth chart that maybe does not have very much experience, he could be very prone to a lot of interceptions, a lot of turnovers, a lot of sacks due to his inexperience and stepping up to a new level in the professional game compared to his collegiate career. So you don't really want to limit what you're doing with your defenses versus your quarterbacks or your other skill position players. A quarterback can go out there and put up 200 yards, one touchdown, throw three interceptions, get sacked four times, and both the defense and that quarterback are end up in an optimal line. So it's something that you want to be a little bit more open to in comparison to the regular season. And you realistically are targeting what you deem to be a lower end quarterback situation on that day. And that could be, uh, it's a rookie. It's a quarterback that's not very good. Typically, I will give more credit to um, career backups, guys that have played in the NFL for six, seven years that have produced in the preseason and that have shown that they're at least capable of handling preseason work because they may be less injury prone than a guy coming in for his first game. So that's enough of talking about uh, just an overall overview of how to approach preseason. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about it as we go um, in future episodes, and we'll be live for some of our shows coming up for bigger slates as well. All right, so going into tonight's game, we have New England versus the Giants, and we have Baltimore against Tennessee. Uh, we're going to start with the Giants-Patriots game. It kicks off at 7 p.m. tonight. We're going to go through each team, and I'll go through the depth charts a little bit with what we're expecting. Um so the Giants, we have the most information, I would say, about New York tonight. Uh, the starters are expected to play one quarter. Then it's expected to go to Tyrod Taylor in second. And then Davis Webb is expected to get the entire second half. So what we're looking at here is we're going to go through each position. I'll tell you my thoughts on it, um, and we'll break it down. So when you look at the quarterback, uh, I don't really have much interest in Jones and Taylor. Uh, one quarter each is less than what we're going to see out of some other quarterbacks on the slate. So it's very hard for them to really produce in that short time frame. Uh, Davis Webb, so he's going to play the entire second half is what we're expecting. Uh, if he gets two quarters, I would rather have that than one quarter of Jones and Taylor. However, I will say that the back end of the game is usually more bland than that of the first half. So you'll see a lot more runs and a lot more of a bland offense that isn't really uh, explosive and producive. So in reality, all three of these quarterbacks to me are not great. Um, comparatively to a couple of the other guys on the slate, which we'll get to. Uh, running back. So a common theme on this slate at running back for me is that there's not a clear, clear, clear cut thin room. All the running backs uh, situations are pretty much four to five guys. So if I think that all the running back situations are going to be similar and I can expect similar playing time throughout all of the running back situations, in those situations, I prefer to lean a little bit more towards the skills that a player has instead of just the volume, because the volume is going to be comparative. So uh, Saquon Bar Barkley is someone who I normally would not discuss at all. However, with the starters expected to play a quarter in this game, Barkley could get a bit more of a role than you would expect someone of his stature to normally get. Uh, definitely make sure you follow along in Discord today and on Twitter to see if there's anything that contradicts Barkley's playing time. Uh, I'm recording this about 10.30 a.m. Uh, Thursday, so anything that comes out after 10.30 will not be mentioned in this video. It will be discussed in Discord and on Twitter uh, through Beat Writers, and I will provide info uh, in, the in the Discord as well. So you look at that, and then you have Matt Breida, we don't expect to play, which then leads to Brightwell, Williams, Corbin, and Platzgummer. Uh, definitely looks like Brightwell and Antonio Williams are battling for like that third running back role. So I think that we'll see quite a bit out of both of them tonight. I would expect them to get the most playing time of the group at running backs. Um, in terms of Corbin, Corbin is a pretty talented back out of Florida State. Uh, was a good pass catcher there as well. And then Plaskummer. So we saw last week, Cottrell at the back end of the game is what won people GPPs. Uh, he was a guy that came in, got the bland run at the end of the game, got quite a bit of volume, and was able to outscore everyone, I believe, on the slate except for one player. Uh, I think he did not beat someone. I just don't remember who it was. So 
like guys like that can definitely be used in the GPP. And that's realistically how you're going to be, uh, you're going to have an advantage in GPPs by playing guys that are more back end that are going to be low owned. Like if all five of these running backs get, let's say a quarter or 10 minutes of action, they all are going to get hypothetically, let's say five to six touches. So in theory, it takes one of those five or six touches where someone just hits a crease and, and scores. And all of these guys are going to be capable of doing that. So you can play a guy like Platzgummer at the bottom. He is 1% owned and he rips off like a 60 yard touchdown. And all of a sudden he ends up being one of the better plays on the slate. And if you have him, it can be a differential in GBPs. You'll see that a lot at all the positions. Uh, quarterback is one where I don't really go off base. Mostly I try to stick with the guys who I think are the best plays on the slate. But running backs, receivers, tight ends takes one play for them to realistically get there and end up near the top of the results for the day. So I, I, those are where you want to win your GPP set. All right, looking at the receivers, uh, again, this is a really deep group. Uh, it's not really one that I want to target much. The only person that's of interest to me, and I think he will be relatively chalky uh, in GPP and in cash games, is Wandale Robinson. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Wandale, he is a guy that was used both in the pass game and in the rush game in college. Uh, he caught 100 plus balls last year at Kentucky after transferring from Nebraska. And also when he was at Nebraska, this is a guy that had 20 plus carries in one game. So this is a guy that can be utilized in both the backfield, in the slot. He can go deep. He's caught some deep balls as well um, when he was at Kentucky. So this is a guy that can be really used. I think they're going to try to get him involved. They want to get him some touches in this game. So he's at least someone that will be involved. Um, looking through the rest of it, there's going to be other guys. Like I said, you can throw GPP darts at them. They're not of major interest to me and are behind other people, but that's what makes them good GPP plays. Uh, looking at the tight end situation, uh, Ricky Seals Jones has not been practicing. We do not expect him to play. Again, though, it's still a very deep position where we expect like five tight ends to run. Uh, Bellinger is going to be the leader. He caught a few balls at San Diego State, but he was never really a touchdown threat, uh, despite being a rather tall individual. So I think that there are options at tight end, but for the Giants, I don't really love any of them. Bellinger would be the one guy that I look to a bit, but I'm not super interested. In terms of the Giants defense, I think they're probably the second best defense on the slate. They're getting a Patriots team that is not expected to play their starters at all, while the Giants are expected to play some starters. So I think that will probably give them an edge um, in terms of defenses on the slate. All right, now we're going to move on to the New England Patriots. And this is a team tonight that does have some thin rooms, as you'll see here as we go down the list. So at quarterback, we are not expecting the starters to play. Reports came out today that the starters are not going to play. Now, who that all includes in starters, we can't be sure of. Um, we can be sure it's probably going to include Mac Jones, Damian Harris, Devontae Parker, Jacoby Myers, and Hunter Henry. Uh, the question will be, is Johnu Smith, Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar, Ramondre Stevenson, will those guys also get similar treatment as starters on the offense? And that's something to keep note of. Um, in the event that we see that, it could make the thin rooms even more thin, which we'll talk about when we get there. But first option up here is quarterback. Mac Jones not expected to play. Uh, Brian Hoyer's been around the league forever. I do not expect much out of Brian Hoyer. Uh, Bailey Zappi probably has the most upside in terms of snaps of all quarterbacks on the slate. Um, I don't think anyone could be expected to play as much as Zappi. And this is a guy who has set records in the collegiate game, uh, both at Houston Baptist, then at Western Kentucky, because the offense literally was just Bailey Zappi throwing the ball to people. Uh, and the guy just put up monster numbers and monster stat lines. I think here we will see a situation where the tight end situation for New England is completely non-existent. I think they're going to have to run a lot of four wide receiver sets, and I think they're going to throw the ball a lot with Zappi in this game. So I think he's one of the best uh, quarterback players on the slate. I think he's going to get tons of usage, and I think they're going to throw the ball with him when he's out there. All right, looking at running backs, uh, we're not expecting Damian Harris to play. James White's out on the pup. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson, I don't expect to play much. He's been banged up and just returned to practice, uh, and this is a guy that's established for them from, uh, from last year. So I just don't really think he's going to play. That leaves Pierre Strong, J.J. Taylor, Kevin Harris. Uh, Pierre Strong is a guy out of South Dakota State. Uh, he has pretty elite measurables. He is a very fast running back, definitely has the ability to crack a long touchdown run. I really like him. He's probably my favorite running back on the slate. 
Uh, Kevin Harris has been working with the twos in training camp. I think he's a very serviceable back as well. Then J.J. Taylor, again, if we're thinking the top three guys are out, that really only leaves three running backs that are going to have to eat the entire game for New England. So that means Kevin Harris, Strong, and Taylor are going to play a significant amount more than that of the Giants running backs and all other running backs on the slate. So all three of these guys are very good. I think Strong is going to be uh, more chalky of the three, and then I think the other two will be less owned than Strong. J.J. Taylor will probably be the least owned of the three, so he's probably a great GPP play as well due to that. All right, looking at the receivers, again, so we just saw a New York Giants team that had 14 guys listed. Looking at the Patriots, they only have 10, two of which we definitely don't think will play, another two of which also possibly don't play, and then they also have Ty Montgomery, who does throw a little bit of a wrinkle into the running back situation we just talked about. Uh, He's been practicing at both wide receiver and running back. I think he is more of a threat to the running backs because if he plays more at running back tonight, that turns a three-man running back uh, field into a four-man, and that is on par with everyone else on the slate effectively. Um, That said, the receivers are very shallow. We don't expect much out of Bourne and Aguilar. Uh, Tyquan Thornton is one of the fastest players in the entire NFL. Uh, He's been clocked at a 4-2-8-40. This is a guy that can absolutely take the top off. Uh, so he's going to be one of the most high-owned receivers on the entire slate. I think better GPP options will be that of Trey Nixon, Christian Wilkerson, and little Jordan Humphrey. Uh, so Humphrey is a guy that's been around the league for a bit, was at New Orleans, now is obviously here. He was down the list, but he's been very good in the preseason camp so far. So this is someone that could be shooting up the depth charts and could get an extended run here. Uh, Josh Hammond is likely also going to get some playing time here. That said, obviously with them just signing him 10 days ago, I expect him to be below the other guys and maybe get less run, but that doesn't mean he's not going to get any, because as you see, if we remove Bourne and Aguilar, only leave six receivers, we're going to get to the tight end position in a second. Effectively, they're going to have to play 50, 60% of the snaps, almost all of them. So uh, yes, that could mean someone plays like 80 to 90%, or it could mean that someone plays a little bit less. Um, To note, based on that, Christian Wilkerson was in this role last year for New England in a preseason where they did not have a deep receiving core. And Wilkerson was one of the top receivers in the entire preseason last year. So it's good proof that New England is likely going to play these guys a lot and they're going to get utilized to some extent. So uh, all the New England receivers are totally in play in any format. Um, They're very thin. That room, the receiving room for New England, especially if Bourne and Aguilar don't play, is the thinnest group of the entire slate outside of the New England tight end room. So if we scroll down here, we'll see Hunter Henry is not expected to play with the starters. Aussie Aussie and Keen have both been injured, and I'm not sure if they will play much. I don't expect much out of John U. Smith either. That literally leaves Matt Sokol, the only tight end. And this is a guy that's way down the depth chart. And this is a guy that I talked about earlier with tight ends. He is not a receiving threat. Sokol's not a guy that is going to get tons of um, production at tight end, most likely. However, he is going to be on the field a significant amount unless the Patriots just move to a complete four wide set for most of the entire game. Uh, That said, I still think Sokol's going to play more than any other tight end on the day. And if he catches a couple balls for 20, 30 yards, that can play really well at tight end. Uh, Tight end scores in the preseason are usually very, very low as a whole. So even getting three, four points at tight end can be massive. Uh, Their defense, again, you saw what the Giants quarterback situation is. You know they're going to play the starters. Is it the best situation on slate? No. Is it still a good option in GPPs? Yes. I would definitely use all the tournament or all the defenses in GPPs because it takes one random play where they score a touchdown and puts them at the top defense on the slate. So would still use them. Are they the best to me? No, I don't believe so. All right, moving on to the Baltimore at Tennessee game, we will start with the Titans. The Titans produce what I believe to be the best quarterback play on the slate. We haven't got word yet on whether or not Tannehill will start. However, Tannehill and Logan Woodside have been with Tennessee. They're known commodities. Malik Willis, the rookie, is going to get usage, has mobility. Do I think he has as much playing time upside as Zappi? No. However, I do think that it's possible he does in the event Tannehill does not start, then it will pretty much be the exact same situation of Zappi. And the mobility for Malik Willis pushes him over that of Zappi for me. Uh, Malik Willis is a guy 
that at Liberty, we saw him run tremendous amounts. We saw 100 yard plus games from him. If he gets two to three quarters, which is definitely in the range of outcomes for him tonight, um, I think he's getting two quarters at least. If he gets even more than that, if he gets closer to three, then I think Malik Willis is by far the best quarterback on the slate. Looking at the running back situation, we don't expect Henry and Hilliard to play, and then Torrey Carter is a fullback. So that leaves Jordan Wilkins, Hassan Haskins, Julius Chestnut, and Trenton Cannon at running back. Uh, again, we're having four running backs here. It's a very clear four, though. There's not much of a situation where there's less or more, whereas like New England could range from like five to three and has different guys that could play out of position and play running back as well. Um, I think that all these guys are GPP options. I think Haskins will probably be the most owned of the group. Um, but all these guys are options tonight. Uh, it's We know Tennessee likes to run the ball. It's an offense that is built on running the ball. So all these guys are likely going to be utilized to some extent. Uh, Cannon is the least favorite for me of the running back groups. Uh, he's farther down the list. And he's been around for a while. Um, I don't expect him to make the team. So this might be a situation where we have Wilkins and Haskins effectively battling for a spot. And I think that they will get more usage than that of Trenton Cannon. Uh, if we go down to the receiving core, again, we just talked about New England core that was entirely open and very thin. There was at max eight receivers, possibly down to five, depending on what Ty Montgomery does and Aguilar and Bourne. Looking at the depth chart here for Tennessee, we see... 12 guys. Uh, Reggie Roberson, we think, is going to play. He did leave practice early on 8-8, but we don't know if there was actually an injury or he just uh, went in early. So we have 10 to 11 receivers here. Uh, do we expect to see Robert Woods play very much? No. Uh, the best receivers to me here would be Traylon Burks. Uh, we expect them to get him used uh, to some extent. Kyle Phillips has been raved about during camp as well. And then you could also look down at Marvin Kinsey, Des Fitzpatrick as well as guys who might play. Again, do I like this room as much as that of the Patriots? I do not. Uh, the Patriots room is much thinner. I think all the Patriots plays are better for that reason. However, again, it takes one play to pull the top off and put yourself up there on a slate. All right, looking at the risk, or the tight end options. So I don't expect much out of Austin Hooper and Jeff Swain. The person that I think is one of the best tight ends on the slate is Oconquo. Uh, Conk was a rookie out of Maryland. He's got really good size, really good athleticism, caught 50 plus balls last year for Maryland. The knock on a Conk was his hands are not the best. Uh, so he's definitely prone to putting a few drops out there because he just does not have the greatest hands. However, athleticism is there. Size is there. Speed is there. Uh, I do think with Hudson and Briley more banged up, yes, they have returned, but I think a Conk was a guy that you could expect to get a decent amount of action at tight end and actually has the pass catching abilities to produce in that situation. Uh, on the defensive side of things, the Ravens are going to be playing uh, Brett Huntley and um, what's, and I'm blanking on the other guy at the moment. We'll go over to them too. Tyler Hunt, Huntley and Brett Huntley. That's why I was blank on their last names are very slim, uh, similar, but they're going to be playing those guys a significant amount of the game. So, these are two guys that have been around the league for a significant amount of years now, and they're at least capable of going out there in the preseason and putting together a respectable outing. Um, Anthony Brown at the back end is probably one of the worst quarterbacks on the slate. Uh, for whatever he plays, I would expect there to be production for the defense, uh, but he's going to play at the back end in a very bland style where I don't know how much utility he will get. Um, so it makes me worry a bit for the Tennessee defense. I definitely like them probably the least on the slate. But if Anthony Brown somehow gets a half, that's a very productive defense because he's a mobile guy that will likely run into sacks, and he is a very poor passer. Uh, there's definitely going to be turnover possibilities. All right, looking at the running back situation, um, again, this is a pretty full backfield. We have Mike Davis, Justice Hill, Corey Clement, Nate McCrary, Tyler Beatty. Um, we expect five guys to go in this game. Uh, all these guys are battling for a roster spot or two. I don't necessarily expect tons out of Mike Davis. Uh, he's been a veteran. He's been around the league for a long time. Justice Hill is coming back off of a significant injury. He has looked good in camp, and this is a guy that apparently wants touches. You definitely could see Corey Clement not be used as much either due to being a veteran, which could lead to touches from McCrary and Tyler Beatty. Uh, McCrary crushed the preseason last year, had a very 
very productive workload in the preseason and was pretty good with it. And Beatty's rookie out of Missouri. Uh, this was a guy who caught a significant amount of balls last year. He had like three or four games with seven plus catches. So in the event Beatty plays a significant amount of time, I would expect Beatty to be active in the pass game. And if you're active in the pass game in the preseason, it can be very beneficial to running backs because you catch two or three balls out of the backfield for 15 yards. That's a massive leg up on some of these other guys that only get like eight carries and don't have much to get used to in the pass game. Um, the receiving core for Baltimore is a very banged up unit as well. We don't expect Bateman, Prochet, and Duvernay to really play. Uh, their starters are not really expected to play much. Slade Bolden left practice on the ninth and did not return. Bailey Gaither left practice on the eighth and did not return. And Devin Williams has not been practicing either. So we have a very thin unit here at receiver. Um, for me personally, I like Tylen Wallace the best. Uh, he's a guy that was explosive at Oklahoma State and was also a massive red zone threat. Benjamin Victor is a huge target out of Ohio State. This is a guy that can be a red zone threat as well. But if you look through the receivers that we expect to definitely play would be Wallace, Moore, Victor, Bridges, Polk, and Raleigh Webb. So you really only have six guys that are definitively going to play. It's possible guys like Duvernay, Bolden, Gaither, Williams, it's possible someone plays. But if they're all out and you only have six receivers, it's a very good spot to go with. However, this is a team that utilizes their tight ends a significant amount. So you might see some two tight end sets, which would limit the wide receiver play, which is why I would probably prefer the New England receivers over the Baltimore receivers in a vacuum. However, for GPP purposes and even cash games, like you don't want three guys from New England uh, receiving core, you do want to spread things out. So in the event you want to spread things out, Baltimore is definitely the second best receiving options tonight because of the lack of players that are there. Looking at the tight end situation, so Charlie Kolar is injured. Uh, he's not going to be playing, and Mark Andrews won't play in this preseason week. Nick Boyle reportedly wants to play a little bit. How much he's going to play, I don't know. The two people that I think are very interesting here and are two of the better tight end options are Josh Oliver and Isaiah Likely. Uh, last year for Coastal Carolina, Likely was a touchdown threat. I believe he had 12 touchdowns for Coastal and was – very, very active in their tight or in their pass game was the second most important receiver to them behind Javon Highlight. Uh, and Josh Oliver, this is a guy who last preseason ranked the top one of all tight ends in terms of targets, in terms of catches. Josh Oliver had 20 targets last preseason, which is a significant amount for any player, much less a tight end. And he had 13 catches, which again, significant amount for tight end, much less any other player. So Josh Oliver is a guy that's already produced. I think people are going to play Isaiah Likely um, because he's the rookie. He's coming in. He's a bit sexier of a play. But Josh Oliver totally can be involved in the pass game. We've seen it before. And I expect to see some two tight end sets here. Uh, so I think Oliver and Likely are very strong. On the defensive side for me, Baltimore is currently on a 20-game win streak for those of you guys that are not familiar. Um, I wrote up about it on Scores and Odds. So if you want to look at some betting advice, uh, make sure to check that out. But they are currently on a 20-game win streak, and the last loss that they had was in 2015. So this is a team that takes the preseason very seriously. They typically blitz more than most teams do in the preseason. If Tennessee does not play Tannehill, I think Baltimore defense is by far the best. Even if they play Tannehill and Logan Woodside a half, you're going to get a half of Malik Willis, who's a rookie. This is going to be his first game. He's going to be mistake prone and he's going to run into some sacks as well. So I think Baltimore defense for me is the top defense on the slate uh, based on those reasons. All right. That's going to wrap it up for us today here. Uh, good luck to everyone. Make sure you guys are in the discord and catching up with all the news and notes as the day goes on. So much of the preseason is based on people that will be in and out of lineup. So make sure you guys are there. Uh, the next couple of days we'll have a live show. It'll be a couple hours before slate lock. Um, I'll be joined by a couple people over the next couple days. And then that will be how we progress the rest of the preseason. If it's a bigger slate, we're going to try to have a live show, a super small slate, depending on sizing. Either I will be here for a short video or there will just be uh, Discord covered. So good luck to everyone tonight. I hope that everyone had a good Hall of Fame game and we will see you guys back here tomorrow.